Good morning, and welcome to Fellowship Church Online. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us this week. If this is your first time checking out FC Online, we're so glad you're here. Anyone looking for info about Fellowship Church or upcoming events should check out our website at fellowshipchurchct.com. On the home page, you'll find an area where you can fill out a connection card. This is your go-to in getting connected at FC. When you fill that out, you'll be able to receive email updates and announcements so you'll know about everything going on here. There's also a place on the connection card to fill out prayer requests and next steps. Our pastors and leaders would love to pray for you. Fill out one today. We would love to know that you were here. One of the things that you can find out on our website is information about two conferences being held in May. The Shine Conference for Women is on May 12th through the 14th in Waterville Valley, New Hampshire. And the Warrior Conference for Men is May 19th through 21st, also in Waterville, New Hampshire. If you're interested in attending or just looking for more information, check out our website. Mark your calendars. FC will be hosting Making Waves Vacation Bible Camp this summer. We're so excited to offer the camp for five days this year from July 11th through the 15th. The VBC will be held in the evenings for kids entering kindergarten through eighth grade. Registration and volunteer signups will start next month, so keep that week open. Finally, I want to take a moment and thank those of you who give faithfully to FC. Many of you choose to give online or through our app. Other choose, others choose to mail in a gift. Some have chosen to give through text to give. If you'd like to do that, you can text Fellowship CT to 833-245-6507. However you choose to give, we're grateful to each of you that give, and we know that faithful giving is a sign of spiritual growth. Thank you for joining us and have a great week. your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you say. 
Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. So will I. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. The mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. The rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praises still falls shy, we'll sing again a hundred billion times. Whoa. What happens next here shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. You crank the wheel, the song plays, and eventually, well, you know, the lid flies open. And out comes the fool. Why are we shocked? Why are we caught off guard when, after all, we're the ones turning the handle? Wisdom tells us that our actions have consequences. If you lose your temper, you might just lose your friends. If you don't learn from your mistakes, you're destined to repeat them. And if you run your mouth all the time, eventually, people are just going to stop listening. 
And yet, we just keep on playing the fool. Well, hey there, church. I'm so glad that you've prioritized being here together. I always love our time together that we have. And we're starting this brand new series today called Foolproof. And it's really a series about wisdom. And I hope that you'll find it hugely beneficial. I want to start today by just asking you this question. Do you ever wonder what you want the last years of your life to look like? I don't know why, but I have this vision of a rocking chair. And I'm sitting on this rocking chair next to Laura on a front porch. I've got family around us. And then periodically, friends from FC stopping by and reminiscing about what we've gone through together, all those experiences that we've shared, the good times, the tough times, whatever they might be. And I have this sense of just overflowing with gratitude. And now I don't know what you think of when you think of your last years. I hope it centers around gratitude more than it does about regret, that's for sure. I believe that this can be a reality for all of us to have a life that's well-lived, marked by gratitude. But to live well, what you'll need more than anything else is wisdom. Now, what's wisdom? Wisdom is the God-given ability to determine the right thing from the unwise thing to make everyday decisions that's gonna honor God and value others, leading you to living out God's values in your life. And more than anything, I think we need wisdom. More than we need money, uh, more than it is important for us to meet that special someone this month, or even the fact that we might sometimes feel like, if I can just get a change of venue, I think wisdom trumps all of these things. One of my favorite verses in Proverbs, which is part of wisdom literature, is found in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do and he'll show you which path to take. I want us to center in for a moment on that word depend. That word is used in the context of a chair. Trusting that the chair is going to carry your weight. And so what he's saying here is don't sit and rest on your own understanding. Sit and rest on God's understanding. In other words, his wisdom. We talked a couple weeks ago about having a coach in our life, right? And Proverbs, those writings, that's like having a coach. See, wisdom, it's so important. It comes from this tried and true perspective. And here's what it says. If you do this, you can save yourself a ton of pain. That's really what wisdom and Proverbs are. Now, Solomon writes these words throughout his life, yet unfortunately, he chose not to live by them in the last season of his life, and it resulted in things not ending well for him. So even though he knew how to be wise, he didn't practice wisdom. I mean, this teaches us something, right? You can be highly educated and have the best jobs and still make foolish decisions. Or you can have a GED and walk through life with tremendous grace, practicing wisdom. See, wisdom has nothing to do with your GPA. It has everything to do with what I like to call your LPA, listening and living point average, right? Purposefully pursuing God's wisdom is really what we seek to do. So Proverbs 14, 12 says this, there's a path before each person that seems right but it ends in death. Has that ever happened to you? On the surface, some things seem right, but unfortunately, they lead to pain and heartache. Matter of fact, we can all probably identify, and please don't be offended, but the English word idiot actually comes from the word idios, which means one's own, right? Our own understanding. And someone um, it really means someone who's really shut off from any type of insight. Do you ever know someone that you sp have ever spoken into, but they refuse to listen? I think we could probably all uh, relate to this, right? Maybe if you're a parent, you've tried to sp speak to a child and they just wouldn't listen about a particular thing. And you're just like, man, if you could just get this, things would go better for you. Or maybe a coach who speaks into a player. We see this all the time, even in the pros where a coach will speak into a player and a player will have nothing of it. And we just look at this from afar off and go, why won't they listen? Or maybe it's an employer who wants to speak into an employee to be able to help them to be able to take a next step 
in their career. Or maybe it's an employee who wants to speak into an employer to be able to give some valuable insight into how they're leading. But if they're not listening, nothing's happening. So elsewhere in Proverbs, wisdom is also described as a woman who's calling out for people to listen. But nobody's listening. Matter of fact, there's a lot of people not listening these days, right? Instead, we're just kind of looking at our phones and we're just looking down at them and we're not really listening to what people are saying. So wisdom has so much to say regarding how to manage our money and conduct ourselves and to work through conflict. It's really amazing. And Proverbs helps us with all of this. So to help you understand this, I want to just let you know that the Bible is made up of certain type of genres. And uh, you have the Gospels, which are the eyewitness accounts of Jesus. You have the Epistles, which are letters to churches. But in the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, you also have wisdom literature. Now, the books that make up wisdom literature are Proverbs, which talks a lot about wisdom, Ecclesiastes, which is written from the standpoint of someone who's a little bit more cynical. They've made some mistakes, taking note of all the unfairness of life at times. And then, of course, Job is considered wisdom literature. Job's a survivor. He lives righteously. He, he lives by wisdom. But at the same time, he loses everything. And his friends debate some principles of the Proverbs with him. They call out uh, Job for things that he never, ever did. God rebukes them. And Job reminds us that life, no matter how we live it, it's still filled with a certain amount of mystery. And God doesn't always fit into the categories the way that we think he should, and he doesn't act out in the way that we think he should, and life certainly isn't always fair. So here's what I want you to understand about Proverbs. Proverbs aren't necessarily promises. They're more like principles. And what I mean by that, it doesn't mean that these Proverbs are going to work out all the time, every time, but it does mean they are the best way to live. The Ecclesiastes and, and, and the book of Job show how that you can apply wisdom, yet this world and human free will, honestly, isn't always perfect, right? So I want to just walk through a few. And I want to start with one that's really caused a lot of problems for a lot of parents and a lot of guilt for a lot of parents. Proverbs 22, 6. It says, direct, this proverb says, direct your children onto the right path. And when they're older, they will not leave it. Now, remember, it's a proverb, not a promise. And we've seen this, right? Some kids, they're raised in their faith. They're raised in a way of understanding and knowing the ways of God. But they, and they move gracefully into adulthood. They're developing and growing in their faith and in their character. Yet other kids, same household, same situation, decide to take their own path, right? And it doesn't mean something, you know, was wrong with the parents. Yet, let's admit, no parent's perfect. But it's saying this, your best chance for your kids to grow up and stay on this path is to be intentional in setting them on the path, right? And more times than not, they will stay on that path or... If they go off, they'll return to it. But the truth is, every child who grows into adulthood has a free will, don't they? A free will to do what they want and to choose which path to take. Now, we raised our kids in church. You're raising your kids in church. We sent our kids to camp. You've done that probably too as well. And if you haven't, I want to encourage you if there's students to do that. We want to expose them to God and friends who share their faith. We wanted to have other adults speak into their life. So these kids that go into adulthood, they go into all kinds of seasons and directions, right? And what usually happens is not everything's perfect all throughout that, those seasons, especially in their 20s. And you know what it does? it makes your prayer life get a little deeper, doesn't it? And so it's not all bad. It's good for your spiritual walk as well. But sometimes you have to hold on to this proverb. Again, it's not a promise, but it's a great principle. But you hang on to this believing that maybe if they do decide to go off the path, that they certainly will return. And that's our prayer for all our kids. How about Proverbs 16, 18? Here's another one. This is pretty famous. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. We've seen this everywhere, haven't we? We've seen this in sports. 
We've seen this in business. We've seen this in family. We've seen it everywhere. When you start thinking that you know it all, you stop listening to people, right? And when that happens, look out. Pride comes before the fall. You can set your watch by it. Wisdom would say this, stay humble. Have a listening and learning mindset. You can learn in any scenario, in any situation. Never think you know it all. Here's Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Well, we've seen this everywhere, haven't we? Especially in the last few years. But those of you that are in customer service, <laughs> you really understand this, don't you? You can either escalate or you can de-escalate with your words and especially with your tone, right? That's why people with soft skills are so valuable at work. They can read a situation. They can read the room. They know what to say or at least how to say it. And wisdom would say, have a little sympathy. Have a little empathy. Put yourself in other people's shoes. Speak the truth in love. We always try to lead with love. Answer gently. Well, another way that we can go through life foolproof is to center our priorities on God. You know, think about this at your house. When it comes to board games or video games, every family has those who play to win and those who just play for fun. And when you have those different priorities, it makes a difference about what's going on in that house, right? I mean, the temperature of the room completely changes. The tension either grows or it decreases. The point is priorities matter. And wisdom says to have your priorities in order. I'm going to go back to the beginning of Proverbs. Proverbs 1.7 says this, fear, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. In other words, this is where it all starts. Fear in this context, the fear of the Lord, is that awe and that respect we have for God. It's understanding that God is God and you're not. And so we walk with this humility, we walk with this reverence, and when we do, it's so beneficial in our life. You know, an image that I've used to guide me when it comes to my priorities in life is that of a wheel. And in the center of that wheel, the hub is God. And in all of his love, it's there. he's there, his holiness, his wisdom, he's right in the center of my life. I want God to be in the center of my life. This means that before I'm a pastor or my job of working at the church, I want to live a personal surrendered life to God. I want to hear from him. I want to be listening and living by his words and his wisdom. I want to experience his peace and his love. So Jesus said, if you're willing to lose your life, you know, to listen and to just follow God, you're going to find it. You're going to find a rich life through him. So every day I invite God into my everyday life. Maybe it's over my coffee or while I'm driving in my car, I'll have a conversation with him. Or before stepping into a meeting or even at every meal, I'd like to just invite God into that moment. God, I want to hear from you and I want to follow your wisdom. You know, this affects all the important areas that are priorities in our life, right? So kind of like spokes off of the hub of this wheel, one of those areas is our family. Family should always be a priority for us. I want God in the center of my family. You know, the definition of success is not how much money you make or what you achieve. It's really having those who are closest to you love and respect you the most. It's pouring your life and your attention and time into them. It's living with integrity and consistency. Now, you're not going to be perfect with this, but being consistent. Do you, do you treat those who are closest to you, your family, with the same patience you do with people at work? I mean, you can't always be at your best at home. I understand that but they're worth your very best, aren't they? I always think about that passage of scripture that Paul wrote about love in 1 Corinthians 13, and this should describe us with our family. Love is patient and kind. Again, we're not perfect. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way, and it's not irritable. I need to hear that sometimes. And it keeps no record of being wrong. So the question that you could ask yourself, a wise question would be this, am I displaying God's love to my family? Well, another area of priority is really our church. And we want God at the center of our life and we wanna engage in our local church. So if you wanna set your life up for gratitude and less regret, 
You need to prioritize your engagement with Fellowship Church. You know, Paul says that the church is the bride of Christ. What does he mean by that? He, he means it's something that Jesus loves deeply. Yeah, it's full of broken and imperfect people, and we're moving together, and we're growing in our relationship with Jesus. But what better place to learn forgiveness and grace? You know, we all grow by the commitments that we make. And a commitment to your local church really deepens your faith, and it develops your character. Think about those of you who are married. That weekly shared spiritual experience, it goes a long way in developing and repairing a marriage. And as we learn about our relationship with God, we learn about relationship with each other. Honestly, the same goes for you who are single. We really understand and know how to relate to other people in the context of our relationship with God. You know, my local church isn't just a place for me to get something out of. I think that's how we need to look at this. We have to be careful. It's so easy for us to fall into this, this consumer mentality, right? Rather, church should be a place for us to invest ourselves into. See, not only by serving, but just, just by being. We have people in this community who have such wisdom and life experience. We need them to share that with other people. We have young people with such passion. So this intergenerational learning is so valuable. We all need it. We could all use some mentoring or some coaching. We could all use a little better listening and some encouraging, right? And it's so easy today for us to just silo ourselves into areas where all we have to do is listen to and be with people who think exactly the way we do. And we can do this through technology, cable news, internet sites, chat rooms, whatever it is. They tell us exactly what we want to hear. But in doing so, think about this, it really stunts our growth. We don't grow in love and peace and understanding. We certainly don't grow in harmony And most of all, we don't grow in wisdom. I want to share a passage of scripture with you that might be telling. Paul writes this to a young pastor in 2 Timothy. He says this, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They're going to follow their own desires, and they'll look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They'll reject the truth, and they'll chase after myths. You know, it sounds a lot like today, right? Sometimes, guys, in a church context, in a church setting, we're not always going to agree 100 times, 100% of the time. We need to hear things, though, that challenge us. That's how we grow. Things that we might initially even disagree with, but then give permission to the Holy Spirit to speak to us deeply about these things. And this happens best in the context of community. I mean, Paul writes more about community with the church in Romans 12. He says this, Love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring each other. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Be wise and commit to and engage in community, guys. It's an investment in you, but it's also an investment to what God loves, his bride, the church. That's wisdom. How about the area of health? That should be a priority. And with God in the center of it, what does that look like? Well, I think a lot of times when we think of health, we think of our physical health, diet and exercise, vitally important. But there's also our mental health, our emotional health, our spiritual health as well. You know, even me in the last season, I found a good counselor that's helped me to navigate some of my inner world. And honestly, I'm better for it. I'm a little more self-aware. It's allowed me some pathways through some things. It's been good for me. So a good question to ask when it comes to your health is, am I living in a way today that's going to help me thrive tomorrow? Think about it. That's wisdom. What about our work? What does it look like to have work, have God in the center of our work? I mean, work is important. You know, many think that God doesn't care about our work, but work is actually a gift from God. Work was a part of the Garden of Eden before the fall. God himself is a God who works. And there is this satisfaction in a job well done. He's created that in us. And on top of that, we learn so much about our abilities and talents, our ability to develop and uncover what God's blessed us with. But we'll talk more about work and wisdom next week. 
Now, keeping God in the center of your life, prioritizing his values and his wisdom leads to a life of more gratitude and fewer regrets. So again, imagine the end of your life. What would it look like to build your life on the wisdom principles of the Proverbs? To live a life where you're known for your honesty and faithfulness. For, to, you're known for your wise stewardship and spending. To have right priorities in your life. You know, it doesn't really matter if you come to the end of your life and you have all kinds of stuff and achievement. I mean, it's fine to have those things, but that's not the end all be all. What matters is your character. What matters are your relationships. And what matters is that you've grown in wisdom, in God's love, and in his peace. It reminds me of what the writer of Proverbs says in Proverbs 17, 24. Sensible people keep their eyes glued on wisdom, but a fool's eyes, they wander to the ends of the earth. It's so easy to get distracted, isn't it? To take our eyes off the road. And how can we you know, take everything that we talked about today and simplify it so that we can keep our focus on this? Well, I've been throwing some questions to ask uh, for you to be able to guide and direct you in your life. Maybe we can begin by asking this overall question every day this week. And here's the question. What's the wise thing to do? In any scenario and situation that you're entering into, ask the question, what's the wise thing to do? Is it wise for me to get even in this situation? Is it wise uh, to give them a piece of my mind? Is it wise to spend this money on this item? Build your life on God's wisdom. Here's what you can do to get as a start. If you haven't already, reach out to God right now. Ask him to forgive you for those times that you've gone on your own path and say, God, I want to walk with you. Maybe you've never had a relationship with Jesus. The wise thing to do would be to open your heart to Jesus, who loves you, who gave his life for you, and who rose again from the dead and wants to lead you through life with incredible wisdom. Following him is going to lead you to greater gratitude and certainly fewer regrets. And isn't that what we all want anyhow? I hope that you'll take the path of wisdom and join us next week as we continue with this series on Foolproof. And I'm rooting for you.